I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. I'm joined again today by Diana Cooper, the Executive Director of Brookings Core Response. Hi, Diana, and welcome back to the show. Hi. It's been a minute. It's so good to see you. <laughs> yeah, it's good to be here. I know. <laughs> <laughs> good to be here for a minute. In our nice, safe space. I know. It, really, it really is nice. So, you know, I'm I'm looking out at that gray weather, and it's chilly, and we're mm-hmm. definitely moving into autumn. This time of year has always kind of felt like new beginnings for me, and and I wonder if it's kind of a throwback from when I was mm. in school, because, you yeah, know, September yeah. was always the beginning yep. of the new school year, and it was like, okay. Exciting time. Right. And and whatever I did last year is gone, like the summer erased it. So I'm, I'm starting Everybody's to probably new. forgotten. <laughs> Yeah, I forgot everything I learned. Yeah. This is this is my, well, a lot of people, but this is my favorite season. Yeah, yeah. I think so many people, this is their favorite season. Yeah. It's, it's not really mine mm-hmm. because I know we're going towards the dark. That's what I like. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I really like sunshine and brightness. Yeah. And I love it when it doesn't get dark until 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night. I love that. Yeah, well, so, you don't have four kids that you're trying to put to bed at eight o'clock. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> that so is, I mean, we have blackout curtains, but that only helps so much. Oh, God, that would be yeah. Kids, go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care if you summer, want water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for me, it also means that football is starting, and oh, I right. I love football. I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers uh-huh. fan, and I love football. Um, and we're also starting to get ready for the holidays. Yeah. I noticed that Bymart has all of the Halloween candy out. Uh-huh. And somebody at Freddy's told me that they were cleaning out the garden area to make way for the Christmas trees. Oh, wow. Already. Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, we we have just a fake one that we have used for like 10 years almost. But I always love the... Fresh. Oh, I love the fresh. Yeah, yeah that's so much nicer. That's really all I will have. Uh-huh. Although, although last year um, there was a shortage of Christmas trees, and hmm. we just ended up not getting one. Well, also because I'm getting a little too old to shoulder that Christmas tree from the lot. Grab a little twig from <laughs> outside. Get a little Charlie Brown tree going on there. It's fine. So, so my grandson actually made. A Christmas tree out of a piece of cardboard. Oh. It doesn't look okay. It's a triangle. It's tree. a tree. It's a green triangle. Ask any four year old. <laughs> well, he's 12, but Same. that's okay. <laughs> yes, it worked just fine. All right, this is our Christmas tree for this year. <laughs> Very funny. So I know that CORE has a lot of stuff going on now mm-hmm. as well. Um, I saw in the Somewhere, I guess it was an email uh, the other day about a new health insurance program called BHP. I think that's yeah. as distinct from OHP. Yeah, different, slightly different from OHP, although it's um, run through the same funding, the Medicaid funding. So it, it's coming. So is it coming from the state or is it coming federally? Well, it's it's all federal it's all federal state? funds that go to the state, and the state okay. gets to decide where they want to put it. And okay. similarly, it gets then dispersed to the CCOs, and they have some flexibility in sort of what specifically what what flex services they offer, meaning okay. outside of billable services. So there's flexibility all the way down the line, okay. um, and the state each state is autonomous in how because this this all comes from the Affordable Care Act in 2014. These these this has been allowed since 2014. Hmm. And any state could, um, I mean, not just this, but specifically um, different types of health uh, benefits and um, kind of, I guess, income allowances that the yeah, state. Yeah, because BHP uh-huh. is, is like OHP, yeah. except that it's, it's just it's expansion. For slightly higher incomes. Yeah, it goes up to 200% of the federal poverty level as opposed to the 138% which Oregon has typically had. Ah. Uh, the, the pandemic, I think during the pandemic, they actually did have a pandemic OHP in a sense. And so that yeah. was that was this. That was expanded up to okay. 200%. So that's always been allowed since 2014. Hmm. But not every state, you know, states are, they kind of determine, you know, what where their gaps are in healthcare and 
um, where they want to put the money they get from the federal government. But also there's additional funding that they're allowed to pull down from the federal government. They kind of have to apply for it. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's different waivers and, um, you know, different bills that have been passed on, on a federal level that they can actually pull funding from. But they're all, that also comes with, you know, different requirements depending on what funding they're pulling from the government. So not all states choose to pull even most of that money. Some, mm. some I think Florida and um, I can't remember what other state. Florida is one that doesn't uh, doesn't pull down some of the additional Medicaid benefits and wow. and SNAP benefits. I'm not quite sure why uh, you wouldn't want to. Maybe it's just the restrictions. Mm -hmm. But um, And maybe some just kind of oppose the ideology of those benefits. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure. But Mm -hmm. Oregon's been sort of on the forefront of, especially when it comes to health care, for, you know, accessing those federal benefits for the Oregonians. So this is just another piece that they've decided, you know, I think... I think we learned a lot through the pandemic, and the state of Oregon obviously learned, oh, we can afford to cover Oregonians up to 200% of the poverty level. So, yeah, I think that— I wonder that, how many extra people that that is. Uh, yeah, I'd be curious. I bet you that there's some numbers out there. I haven't I specifically seen two. them. Yeah. Um, but if you've got the group of people from 138% of the poverty level to 200% of it, I mean, mm-hmm. that's that's got to be a sizable number of people who Yeah, and, it, and that's now... actually um, because our family qualifies for OHP, which is the Oregon Health Plan, up to the 138%. Mm-hmm. And so for the BHP... Um, I, and I don't have the numbers for the, for OHP in front of me. Right. In fact, um, my staff was just recently trained on OHP assistance, so they probably have kind of those numbers nearby. But right. I do know that uh, as far as income per year for one person, it's up to uh, $29,160, and then it goes up close to about $10,000 per person you add. So $39,000 mm-hmm. for two, 49000 for three, and then um, 60,000 for four. And I, we have a family of six, so I'm, I'm not sure quite, you know, it's probably, um, close to 80,000 or, or something. Yeah. So that actually, um, we qualify for OHP, which means people making more than I do, mm-hmm. which if but people don't know, I make about 62,000 a year. Um, and that's our total income. So people making more than me will still qualify. For OHP, which is um, or great, BHP, but. because it's not like that's free medical care. OHP. I mean, oh. y- you you are still paying something, aren't you? No, no. OHP typically is it covers all copays and expenses. Oh, excellent. So this actually it it is essentially free health care for those folks. Excellent. And again, like these are the folks who are. I mean, most of these people are working. Yes, and especially when you're talking about 138 to 200 percent. That's that middle gap yeah. um, that struggles so much with loss of benefits once they start making just barely enough to pay their, you know, their own household expenses. Right. So, one hundred and thirty-eight percent to two hundred percent of the federal poverty level is a a really great section of the yeah. economy to take care of. Right. Um, right. But yeah, so it, it's essentially it is free. I don't know why. I don't know that anyone would have copays. Usually with OHP, you don't have any copays. Okay. Um, and, and you don't there's no, pay for any, there's, there's no, no out of pocket. Great. Um, it, great. there are just like with any insurance company, you know, there's a line item of like, I mean, you can literally look, go online and look at the line item mm-hmm. and see, oh yes, broken arms are covered, but mm-hmm. mm, you know, hernias are one that's difficult to get covered. Um, when I worked at all care, you know, I also had a lot of, um, people who would call who got denied services. And most of the time it was just a simple matter of like, oh, your doctor forgot to submit the notes. But for some procedures, specifically hernias, that was one that got denied a lot. So that's kind of under the line unless it meets certain other criteria. Wow. Yeah. So there there are some, you know, there's certainly some downsides to our current healthcare system. But I think also uh, for the most part, it's pretty effective the way that they work it. And there are exceptions. So you can, you know, appeal it and Right. Um, certainly, if it's medically necessary, it's a lot easier to get it to go through. But it's not. It it's certainly not the Cadillac version. Um, no, you know, no. I was. It's I was, not full on. You know, no. I think Japan has better health care than we do, and so does France. 
But even, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day who was getting um, a bilateral mastectomy. Mm -hmm. And when I had mine done in 2002, the implants went in the day that they removed my breasts, the implants went in. For this woman, she has to go back to another surgery in three months or three weeks, I think, to get the implants put in, which is like... Wow, that's yeah. not so, the gold standard. This is a result of how the United States operates its healthcare system. This is unlike any other. Um, I mean, you have to wait sometimes for procedures, but not usually for the follow ups and things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, in other countries, um, there can be wait lists for things for more, although those are usually more elective surgeries, mm-hmm. but we right. even we know even still elective surgery sometimes is pretty important. No, exactly. Um, exactly. So I think they considered my sister's. Um, kidney removal um, during the pandemic as elective when it was clearly not. So, <laughs> so again, you know, there, there's okay, definitely that's some gaps. Ridiculous. I know, I know. Um, I think she had to wait a whole nother year or something oh, to get it out. I can't remember. Dear. Um, but, uh, but, you know, was successful and she right. got it done, but she did have to wait. And in other countries, you know, in England, that's a good example. Yeah. Sometimes people have to wait, mm-hmm. you know, up to nine to 12 months for certain surgeries. And so they just, travel to the United States or other countries and pay cash because right. they can get it quicker. The United right. States does have fairly quick health care when mm. we, you know, cover it. Right. Um, but yeah, so when you're on Medicaid, um, there's definitely some uh, delays. And a lot of that, again, has to do with the way that the United States sets up our health care system. We have a lot of billing codes. We've got a lot of administrative mm-hmm. um, costs. The United States has the highest administrative cost for healthcare than, you know, higher than any other country. Well, in it's fact, also so stinking mm-hmm. complicated, isn't it? I our, mean, our, just the codes themselves. Yeah, they're very complicated and they take up, um, I think it's close to a third of, so if you had $3, every $3 you spend on healthcare, um, one of those dollars goes straight just to administrative costs. And that's not like that in any country. Um, it's crazy. With, with universal healthcare. Yeah. And we don't have universal healthcare, but right. we're, Organs dipping its toes in, right? But we're still stuck with this administrative burden, so we're not right. stretching our dollars the way we could, right? And you know, the United States pays more in healthcare than the entire annual budget of Russia, so <laughs> the entire GDP <laughs> oh, of Russia. Wow! So um, we spend a lot in healthcare, and again, so it's like I think it's, um, gosh, I can't I can't remember the exact dollar amount, but. Um, it's close to a fifth of our overall budget for the United States. So 20% of United States GDP is spent on health care. And a third of that is administrative. That's crazy. It is very crazy. I mean, it's just that's, All of that administrative costs could go back into our social programs and senior services. And, you know, and the other part of that is the, the actual insurance that everybody has to buy all of this right. insurance, right? So the insurance companies are making out like bandits, yeah, right? And, and because you often, you know, if you lose a job, you lose insurance, you switch to other insurance, or maybe you're going through the marketplace, but, you know, regardless, all of that cha- all of these little gaps and changeovers is what increases that administrative burden because right. now you're going off of a plan, you're coming on a plan. Right. You know, it's, somebody's got to enter that got, inter- yeah. information all into the yeah. So, you know, we we harp a lot on the single payer healthcare systems because we look at other countries and we're like, oh, well, we don't like that wait list or oh, we don't like um this piece of it. We can do whatever we want. We don't have to mimic them completely. Right. But a single payer healthcare system is Miles more effective than what and we're doing, and it could be streamlined. Now. Absolutely, I mean, it, you know, so that there isn't yeah. administrative waste, right. which is you know, yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, this is kind of a, a a philosophical discussion, but the reality about having affordable health care available to everybody and really affordable health care, mm-hmm. it it seems to me it brings the whole. Your your whole populace is comes up, yeah, right. I mean, it's not like you know, oh, I I don't want to spend twenty dollars so that you can get healthy. Well, if you get healthy, right. then your children are probably going to get healthier, and that means all of the costs are probably going to yeah. go down. It's just well, and your contribution to society, and not in the sense like how many bags of wheat did you 
pull today. You know, like not not the not the bootstraps mentality, but your contribution to to society um, significantly improves with your health. We all know that. Yes. Um, when you know, for for instance, ten years ago, my best plan. You know, the the plan I had and saw for my life. Of course, I was in my addiction at the time, but. Um, the plan I saw for myself was uh, if I just get on disability, um, you know, that's the best it's going to be for me. So I'm going to get on disability and, um, we'll, we'll just ride that out the rest of our life. That's what I really thought. That's where I was in my life. So, um, but because I have access to the healthcare I do and cause I've had OHP this whole time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was able to, even though it was, it, it was a struggle access to services and healthcare, um, you know, I left this community and went to a place where there was more access and more health care and was able to get my needs met. And now, I mean, we're about to dive into the contributions I'm making to our community. So exactly. It's not. Um, and you are not unique. No, I am not unique. And <laughs> no. that's, yes. I, I, I realize that there are people, you know, my friends, my family who think I am, but I am not. And um, I think everybody can live up to their best potential with Absolutely. better access to health care. And, and there are so many people that if they, I think that if they just had their basic needs met, yeah. like their basic health, their basic housing, basic food, just yep. basic needs met so that they could actually put their their mental energies and their physical energies into doing productive things. Mm-hmm. Most people would do that. Most people would. Well, most people, I mean, are it's it is um well, depending on I guess what what theology or um psychology you believe in. Uh, you know, we've got 10,000 years plus of of humankind and in getting to this moment that we're sitting in here today recording, but our brains are still very much the same as they were. And, you know, we can't, we can only handle so much in a day. And, you know, it's not like we've, we've increased our capacity for on our phones, they, in our computers, they can store so much more. Right. Our brains can still only store so much and we can still only push so hard. Yep. And when my brain is overloaded, it's not pretty. No. (laughs) It's not a pretty sight. We we need to take care of our bodies and our health and yeah. uh, Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about um, what CORE's doing uh, because both both healthcare and housing are really critical yeah. needs that are really form the bedrock. I think if if somebody's going to be able to thrive in life, healthcare and yeah. housing, some kind of shelter. Yeah, um, and. You know, we didn't really have, um, as I think, housing has always been a problem. Housing, you know, prior to the 1930s and 1920s area, um, housing was, you know, there were slums, there was lice, there was all kinds of issues. And so housing's always been an issue, but homelessness hasn't been an issue the way it is now. Right. Um, I mean, ever in our in, in our history. So it's been probably... Uh, the last 40 or 50 years that we've seen it develop the way it is now. And a lot of that does have to do with regulations around um, sanitation and housing and all of that. And so, you know, yes, you cannot cram 30 people into a one-bedroom apartment anymore. Um, So regulations have somewhat contributed to that. But I think that just lack of housing in general and lack of um, restoration of housing too. You know, we lose housing and do we, are we rebuilding? Right. Or are we just letting it rot? So. Um, and the reality is, just so that nobody gets the idea that we are advocating for sticking 30 people in right, one yeah. room, right? Not, definitely not. That is not. not a good thing, yeah. right? No, those are called improvements yeah. as you, you know, get the yeah. regulations that allow people to live not only in an affordable mm-hmm. place, but in a place that actually is livable. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have bugs and, you know, yeah. 20 million and, people on top of you. And post, you know, 1920s and 1930s, as we started implementing a lot of pu- really public health regulation to improve 
housing. And it, that's where we kind of came up with a lot of our landlord tenant laws and things like that. Was from public health. Yeah, public health. Um, and of course, because, 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 plagues and... because the government realized, oh, we cannot trust landlords to take care of their places in such a way that it doesn't. Well, I mean, to be totally honest, what happened was the slums were contributing to rats and lice and scabies that were then traveling and making their way into these suburban, um, you know, white, God rich forbid. neighborhoods. And yeah. and the outcry was so huge that the government came down. And, if, and all of this time, landlords are kind of saying, well, you know, they're the ones – the tenants are the ones living in it. They need if, – if a rat comes in, they need to take care of it. It's not our responsibility. You know, we're providing a roof. And, and but of course, most of those didn't even have indoor plumbing, um, or it's just a hole in the floor. And yeah. so they're saying, you know, well, we're providing a space; they need the one to take care of it. Well, the tenants couldn't; they had no resources to take care of it. Whereas the landlords did, and it may sound like you know shoving it off onto the landlords, but if you are going to own property and rent that out, then yes, you're liable for the state of that property. So if if the tenants ruining it, you you can. You can evict them, right. and that's part of your rights. Right. But yeah, so it, essentially, it was um, infesting these richer white neighborhoods, and um, the government finally said, "Oh yeah, we're going to step in." And so they instituted a lot of laws. But out of that also came a lot of housing built, because this is also post World War II right. when um, the GIs were coming yeah. home, and, and you know there was so much money and services yes. being brought into our um, country. That's, you know, Medicaid, the Social Security Act, mm -hmm. Medicare, all of that. So we did a lot of really good stuff up until about 1980 when we kind of just, the 1980s is when we said, oh, well, if you don't have housing by now, you're, you're just, you're a bum. And suddenly the conversation shifted yeah. away from our poor elderly and our poor mm -hmm. um, sick people and our these women and their children and these poor workers who were homeless to, oh, no, drugs are, are now, we want to fight drugs. And so that's when, right. you know, the war on drugs started and the conversation really shifted about homelessness and it became more of a moral issue as opposed to a public health issue, right. which is what it is. And right. I think we're getting back to that in a way. Um, well, I mean, I know we are because that's how we got uh, measure 110, that's how we got um, a lot of this housing funding we're about mm -hmm, to talk about. Mm -hmm. Like, this is coming from us realizing that, you know, we did a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. And so now we need to restore that. What is Measure 110? So Measure 110 was passed in 2019 um, by an overwhelming majority of Oregonians to basically decriminalize um, personal use of substances. So it's not legal. It's just not going to... Um, it, you're not going to end up in jail. You're going to get a fine or, or get diverted to treatment. Measure 110 is really interesting because um, the feedback that I've heard from um, people who are not directly, you know, involved in it or anything, it's, you know, people kind of standing on the sidelines saying, oh, this is wrong, then this is wrong. But um, But the feedback is basically, well, you know, we've made it uh, impossible for the police to put them in jail where they belong. And so mm -hmm. Measure 110 is, you know, a horrible thing and should be repealed and, you know, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I've heard kind of arguments um, as well. Although I'm I really, truly, and as, as we get into more of this, I think people understand why, but I've really had, you know, had to keep my head down the last year and a half because there's so much that we're trying to get done. But um, I have heard some of that. And I've also, um, not only our own data, which has been, I mean, just today I sent actually an email off to the governor's office with a few other contacts with some of our data over mm -hmm. the last um, nine months be as a result of Measure 110 funds, which show, I mean, a significant increase in people that we're serving. Um, and so what I can say about the, you know, people not going to jail and, you know, is this working? Because um, a lot of also what I've heard is, well, we've had an increase in overdose deaths and we know that there's been an increase. Not only that, but now we're finally actually collecting the data. Um, Curry County hasn't done a, a good job historically of collecting overdose reports. And you you can only, it has to be first responders that report that to the state. We cannot report overdoses that we even that we attend to so if wow. we come up on a camp and 
which has happened, Mm -hmm. and we administer Narcan. We can't report that other Mm. than through law enforcement. And so if the person declines any kind of services, that doesn't get reported. So we report our numbers separately, but it's it doesn't go into the formal state numbers. So um, that's kind of one of the the drawbacks is we haven't, it, you know, having to have it go through first responders um, for whatever reason, we haven't had very accurate data. And so now there's data starting to be collected. So we're not only seeing numbers rise because data is being collected, yeah. but um, I think also one of the things that people don't take into account, because it's just Oregon that decriminalized it. So if that were true, that that's what's caused the rate of increases, uh, you know, or the increase in overdose and, mm-hmm. and death, Um, And crime, Mm -hmm. which is not what we're seeing with the data. We're not, even in Portland, we're seeing there's no rise in crime right now and and in the last three years as a result of Measure 110. So if that were true, then we would not be seeing a rise in overdose deaths in crime in Washington and California and Idaho and states close to us that have. um, That don't have 110. They do not have 110. Right. But they have other similar policies Mm -hmm. to us in, in, you know, the rest of our legislative policies. So. That's not true. But also, I think that the people that are spouting this rhetoric, um, one, data doesn't support it. There's been no study that I've seen that supports that Measure 110 negatively impacted um, overdoses and crime. But also, people are not taking into account two major factors that increased overdoses and drug use um, in the last three years. And one of those is the emergence of fentanyl um, in the drug world. You know, I and it's huge, huge, and, and everybody knows it's huge. Everybody knows that it's newer. You know, it's not that it's newer. We've never had fentanyl, and we've never had fentanyl on the street, but we've never had it like this. Yeah. Um, when I was using, and this was about ten years ago when I stopped, but when I was using, it was heroin and cocaine, and at that time, um, there were some pretty significant. Um, Sub- newer substances that were hitting the streets. One is called Gator. Um, some other substances made a comeback, you know, Molly, I think, and mm-hmm. um, MDMH and all, all of that, or MDMA. So, you know, there's always like a fluctuation of drugs, but fentanyl was never, I never, was never something I worried about when I was picking up. Uh, it was never something any of us even talked about mm-hmm. um, or heard about. And so it's not a new drug, but it's new and it's the way that it's saturated the right. black market for drugs. So right. that's a huge and component. And you don't know if you're if you're a user mm-hmm. and you're buying, you don't. You don't know. know. We ha- there's a lot of harm reduction that's been doled out because of Measure 110, and one of those is fentanyl test strips. So we we even do fentanyl test strips mm-hmm. now, um, and that's because it's just so prevalent now. So that is. By far, one of the biggest components to that has led to increased um, overdose deaths, and everybody knows it. So there's no, I don't know where the cognitive dissonance is there between the fentanyl hitting the market and becoming as as prevalent as it is, and Measure One Ten being ineffective. I don't know where that, um, how those two things are separate. So the other thing is the pandemic. Um, I don't think it's a secret that mental health has been greatly impacted by the pandemic. Um, I don't think it's a secret that mental health plays a pretty big part in drug use. Um, And so another, and and again, another piece is that people are talking about, um, you know, the crime and the jail and all that. Measure 110 had nothing to do with criminal actions. It had everything to do with self-harm through small amounts of substances. So we're just talking about substance use. We're not talking about other crimes. Those are still punishable. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you don't – what we did with small amounts of substances in the 1980s is we made them felonies. We made them um, actual crimes rather than like misdemeanors. And when really people who were just using small amounts – I mean, anytime you use a substance, the first person you're hurting is yourself. Right. Yes, there are people who um, use enough substances and end up with psychosis and things like that, and they do hurt other people. Um, al- although that's also true for mental health. That's also too f- true for just crisis. Right. You know, you can be in crisis and have that happen to you. So th- those things do happen, but um, the large amounts is what we're really concerned about because that has the potential to kill people. So yes, we want to go after people who are selling these large amounts and manufacturing and all of that. None of that changed. 
The only thing that changed is the small personal consumption of drugs. And what happened is the data shows that you are, I think it's five times more likely to relapse and overdose post-jail discharge within the first, I think it's three days of discharge. Wow. Um, than you are at any point in your, your substance use, including leaving treatment. Wow. So we know that jails contribute to overdose deaths for people who are just users, not, not people selling. And so it would make sense to divert them away from jail yeah. to, to lower the overdose rate. And right. that has happened. We're seeing that happening. We're seeing less people going into the jail. And if we look at the data and say, oh, jail causes people, can cause people to overdose and relapse and overdose, you know, post-discharge, then by all accounts, that's successful. And we actually do, we are starting to collect data now to prove that that, that is successful. So, and that's not my data. That's, you know, these are people that get universities and Mm -hmm. Um, independent studies that get paid way more than I do. So, <laughs> well, going to jail, spending time in jail is is trauma. I mean, it yeah. it really is traumatic. Oh, and, yeah. Have you seen the Curry County Jail? Uh yeah, I've actually toured it. Have you? Yeah, and that was ten years ago. So it was ten years yeah. better shape than it's in yes, now. Yes, it's pretty poor shape. There's a section that's unusable, and so the yeah because there's such a larger population of men. They're in sort of the general population, and uh, women don't have another section to mm. be in, so they put them in um, solitary confinement, and so that's mm. that's just where they're held now. Um, and so, wow. yeah, wow. that that does a lot to your wow. mental health. Yeah, absolutely. And if if the reason you're arrested is because you were getting high, yeah, it, it just like because once they're released, wow. there's not programs. You know, right. There's nobody waiting at the door yeah. for, to say, come on, let's get you right. to, a, to a program. Let's get you to a and meeting. There kind of is some, I mean, certainly you have parole officers and probation officers and things like that. And they're connected. You know, there's there's justice involved connection to mental health and addiction services. And there kind of always has been. But we also know that people fall through those gaps a lot. And this a is lot, Curry County, where there yeah. really isn't a lot of mental health. I mean, they don't necessarily want to engage while they're sitting in the jail. No. And so once they get out, you kind of lose track. Right. And so ultimately, having them go through other services that are non-justice involved, like ours or, right. um, you know, there are ADAPT services that are obviously not justice involved. So right. it's just a better avenue for people. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the stuff that, that you're working on at CORE is... A, there's there's a lot of housing stuff, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I thought it was funny the other day when when you um, had texted me that you had actually lost track of, right. of of a grant that you had written and gotten funded yeah. and you didn't remember writing it. It was like no, okay. it was all sitting in my inbox, That's but I funny. I was confusing a few of them for one grant. Well, you've got like four. I have four housing grants currently. And Holy two of these are very collaborative. Um, actually, three of them are very collaborative. Mm -hmm. Let me think. Yeah. So um, although all four of them will end up being, because that's what housing is. It's yes. just, you've got to work with partners and um, property management, other community partners. So yeah, so we actually have four housing grants that are currently in somewhere along the process. Some have been submitted and are being reviewed by the mm -hmm. state. Um, some are still in writing, and I'm going to be working on those <laughs> very diligently for the next month. Um, one of them's due, I think, October 27th, and or yeah, either October 27th or the 25th. So that's the one that the next one that I'll be um, mm -hmm. working on. And I so. Tell, yeah. tell us a little bit. I mean, just pick one. and Well, I'll start with, um, you know, a couple months ago, I want to say this was May or maybe April, but I think it was May. Um, we had heard that uh, the governor's office, through the balance of state, which there's so – there's a lot in here and I can't really explain all of it, but I'll do my best. Um, so the balance of state is essentially oversees the 26 rural counties in Oregon and then – there's 10 other non-rural counties that have their own um, sort of community action process and oversight. So we have community action. We have ORCA for Curry County. And then technically right now we're also um, – we also have support from Klamath and Lake Community Action Services and 
um, you can, which is Josephine County. So we have three community actions that are kind of involved in Curry County resources, right? Housing resources. Um, so all of these are overseen by the balance of state, and it's balance of state because it represents the other piece of the state, which so is the you've rural. Got, right, you've got the urban. We've got urban and, and, and then metropolitan, and then we've got the rest, the balance, yeah, the balance. Uh, yes, and so uh, we we Curry County is underneath the balance of state, and we um, have historically we've gotten a lot of that housing funding through ORCA, and right now what's different is the state's kind of changing some of their processes and really allowing nonprofits to receive more of that housing funding. I mean, there's always been funding that can go to nonprofits, but I think they're really looking at um, areas like ours that are sort of um, constricted by the capacity of our community action and and other larger organizations that funnel mm -hmm. funds through. So they're really looking at like, how can we get the money directly to the county? So what happened is the state, you know, the governor signed some funding for housing um, pretty quickly after she got into office, and that skipped over the rural counties. And there was Ooh. some reason for that, and I, mm -hmm. I don't know what it was. But obviously we— Didn't make the rural counties happy. No, we had we had a fit, and <laughs> oh, we, we had a fit. <laughs> uh, you know, everybody wrote letters and, yep. um, ca you know, called and left messages. And there was a lot of—the governor toured and had a lot of conversations with, with the different counties— and then ultimately signed um, the the balance of state funding, the mm -hmm. COC, I can't remember exactly what it was. But um, so that funding came down, and I think it was $26.1 million to rehouse. Um, and they wanted to expand shelter capacity and then um, re buy 100 beds and rehouse 450 individuals by mid-2025. So we've got about... Um, a year and a half from mm -hmm. the time we'll receive the funding to to do that, and the requirement on this funding was that it could go it could only go through a local planning group, meaning it had to be like a some type of coalition. It was not it could not be just one agency or um, it could be a, a a government agency or a mm -hmm. nonprofit, mm -hmm. but it needed to be sort of with collaboration. Mm -hmm. So our, our history in Curry County is that we just sort of attach ourselves to Coos County and work with them. But some of us got together and decided, no, we want to have our own local planning group. And so um, I kind of have the most capacity right now. I mean, it doesn't feel like it, but <laughs> I do in in some sense. Everything is relative. Yes, relative. <laughs> um, so, it's, and, and this is with a couple of other really good agencies that we just kind of got kicked off. So we've got... Um, South Coast Equity Coalition, um, Curry Homeless Coalition, Neighbors to Neighbors in Port Orford, the Talo Tribe is on on board. We've got a couple of other um, housing authority is involved. Um, and then we're about to start just pulling in a lot more. And there, there's others too. It's been it's been a really great collaboration. We started in June mm -hmm. um, and we formed as a Curry County Homeless Task Force. So a homeless task force is it has a fidelity to it. It's you know, it's not like state there's no government agency over oversight we're just um a group of agencies and mm -hmm. that got together and decided um that we wanted to have our own group and start doing planning and um but other homeless task force you know they have a charter and they they kind of have um officers and whatnot and it's a way for them to look ahead at funding that's coming down and decide okay who needs to be involved in this funding mm -hmm. and they group up and they start working on it mm -hmm. And, you know, some agencies might be involved in several groups throughout the task force. So we're small. We just got started. But our first project was this, um, the balance of state um, funding, the $26.1 million. So Now, that's not all our money. No, I wish. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> How much does Curry um, County County actually get? Curry County actually gets 594000 roughly. Okay. Um, so... We Brookings Correspondence will receive that funding initially, and then we're going to work with two agencies, um, Curry Homeless Coalition and Neighbors to Neighbors, to make sure we're covering the entire county. Great. This funding, we did not receive funding for shelter support, which I already kind of knew was going to happen because we uh, core submitted a, a shelter addendum to try to receive funding, but it was pretty last minute. I. Mm. 
you know, I I just didn't want us to lose out on that if there was an opportunity to get shelter sure, funding. Right. But we didn't receive that. But what we did receive is the 594000 for rapid rehousing. So that is... And what does that... Yeah. Yeah. What's, so there's, what is that? There's a couple of different types of housing funding. One is like homeless prevention. So if somebody's got an eviction notice or they just lost their job and they need a few months of rent, that helps them prevent eviction. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other is rapid rehousing, which is getting people into housing quickly. So that's first month, last month deposit. You know, we can guarantee up to so many months of rent, you know, and... Because that would be a real sticking point for people who are trying to get into some kind mm -hmm. of housing. If you don't have first, last, and the security deposit... Yeah. And that's a lot of money to come up and, with. And we know there are people who are just like, they've got job offers ready. Mm -hmm. If they could just get into housing and get a good three months of support, right. they would take off. And right. so that's our goal. And that brings up um, the other, the next pot of funding that came up actually um, at the same time. So this was early June. We Which had, could be why you forgot about one, oh, I, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, you're I didn't get a lot of sleep through some of these. I bet. But, <laughs> so that started at the beginning of June. And then just, just right after that came another um, pot of funding. And this is the um, Veterans NOFA that we applied for. So it's uh, Veterans Projects and Small Project Development of Affordable Housing. So that one, I think it was mid-July we had to submit that by. Um, gosh, yeah, I know I can't even remember all the dates. So <laughs> that it's is... It's all running together. Yeah. And that we went after that because, yes, rapid rehousing funding is needed and, and great, and we want to get that, but we also need places to put people. Yes. So we know that developing housing is the next logical step. Yep. Um, and I think everybody kind of knows that at this point. So we worked with a um, local developer, and I think I mentioned this in maybe our last one, um, a little bit about the housing project, but we worked with a local developer um, on the application, and then we had a lot of really good support. Um, Talawa, ha their housing department, was super helpful in um, really just ideas, but the grant itself, mm -hmm. I mean, they really kind of helped throw some of their expertise behind it, which That's helped great. us decide which land we were going to go with and kind of what structure we wanted to right. put in place. Um, and then um, we're working with some local contractors and whatnot as well, you know, if we get the funding to be able to do the project. But that we so we submitted that for about three and a half million to hopefully um, to purchase a motel in Gold Beach to be able to turn it into veterans housing. Nice. And I mean, the the support we got from, you know, Gold Beach, not just the city of Gold Beach, but, you know, there were businesses in, nearby that wrote letters or expressed support. You know, we wow. had, I don't think there was anyone we talked to that, um, you know, there was a lot of questions for mm -hmm, sure, but mm -hmm. um, there wasn't anybody that we talked to that thought that this was a, a bad place for this project. So we're really hoping that that one goes through because that would be um, I think 18 units wow. for veterans housing, wow. and we could easily fill that right, right now. Um, when will you know about that? Probably early November, maybe okay. late October, but it's more likely okay. the first couple weeks of November. And that would enable you to purchase the motel. Yeah, and it's in great condition. Oh, There's very little work we would need to do, mm -hmm. um, and the infrastructure of the building itself, the 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 um, you know, the piping underneath, the electrical work, mm -hmm. it's all in just great shape. Perfect. And so perfect. it would be pretty easy to turn that over mm -hmm. and get those units open. Mm -hmm. So that looking, if we got that, we're, we would be looking at probably spring. Mm -hmm. um, if all the construction is able to get done, you right. know, spring or summer opening. Okay. So that's, and that's also um, sustainable revenue t for other projects. So it's, you know, we're not just solely relying on grant funds mm -hmm. um, for our capacity. So that's mm -hmm. going to be a, a huge help for us. Um, so that's the second one. So that one was due mid-July. Um, so I had to kind of work pretty hard to get that one done, which means I had to put off this other one for about a month. And I had two months to do it. So <laughs> the the next month into August was completing this um, this $594,000 um, rapid rehousing um, mm. Grant, so that one's completed. That one's submitted. Um, it looks like everything's moving forward, and and so we shouldn't have any problem with that. Right. 
Um, and then the day I submitted that um, really difficult one, we were able to oh, – oh, another one dropped in my inbox. This is a third <laughs> one. Um, and this was a – this is a different um, balance of state funding. Uh, and this is basically a competitive NOFA, which is a notice of funding – I think availability. I'm not sure what okay. the A stands for. Right. Um, and this is through HUD, so that's housing and urban housing and urban development from the federal government. So right. this is like you know where the Section Eight vouchers come from and, right. and all and low income housing tax credits and all of that. This is all a lot of jargon, so I realize it's probably going to bore some yeah, people. But, but but a lot of people understand yeah, when you yeah. say HUD, they, yeah, they go, HUD. oh yeah, okay. So this is um, HUD competitive funding. So the f the first one, not competitive. We mm -hmm. were Curry County was going to get that five hundred and ninety four thousand. We just needed to show that we could manage it and where right. we were going to put it. This one, pretty competitive. Mm -hmm. So it it wasn't a guarantee, and I I think this one will end up being collaborative as well in the sense that you know we're going to be working with community partners. Um, so this is 352000 that we're going to be receiving also for rapid rehousing funding. Excellent. So this will help us ensure that we can, you know, we can incentivize with landlords, you know, if somebody maybe doesn't have very good rental history. And when I say very good, most people don't have a lot of evictions. It's mm -hmm. just that they haven't had um, – they haven't had their name on a lease for a long time. Right. You know, they were either doubled up or staying at, right. some, you know, staying at somebody else's house. So you, they don't have a landlord to reference. So we could guarantee, you know, if we receive all of this funding, we would potentially be able to guarantee, you know, up to six months of rent for a landlord while this person gets on their feet and yep. gets a job and, you know, whatever else they're doing. So which will make an enormous difference in that person's life. And think about our it could save our, their lives. Um, our property management right now. You know, there there really is a lot of distrust mm -hmm. um, from homeowners and property managers um, because they perceive a lot of these rules from the state coming down as to be really overreaching. Mm -hmm. And so we want to incentivize them to continue long term rentals. We don't want to lose any more long term rentals. Um, and people just need a bit of a hand up right now yep. um, to get the – I mean, this is going to spur economic development here. We're going to have people getting into housing, solid footing, going to be able to pay their rent and guarantee it so that they can get good jobs and, you know, we can pay revitalize their taxes, some of the – Pay their buy their food. Work in, work in yes. our local restaurants and business. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what we want to see. So this exactly. is this is some some economic development in yes, a sense. Yes, absolutely. Uh, housing is economic development. Yes. So we're excited about – so those are the first three. The The fourth one is um, – this is the one I haven't had time to delve into it. I put in a pre-application to make sure that that this funding just doesn't get lost. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, if, if you are familiar with grants, there are some, especially federal grants, that you have to submit your intent to apply right. and get approved for that before you even apply. Right. So this – What a pain. It is. It is. Um, so this is one that we're hoping to work on with the task force alongside that first rapid rehousing one from the governor's office. And I'm not sure exactly how this is going to look, but um, I do know that this is two, I think it's about 225000 and that is for capacity building for housing. Capacity building. Right, now, yeah. what does that mean? So it seems like such a kind of like, you know... It, it seems like a almost an unimportant grant in the sense where, like, what is that? You yeah, know, it's right. Not, it's not going directly to people. Um, but one of the issues we've had in Curry County for a long time is capacity. We have resources, we have services, we have agencies, but you know, it's usually one or two admin, and it's it's so hard to get anything done. I know that as a small agency, we have two admin staff, and you know, I'm here. I have four housing grants out and I'm, I've got to get all these written. I've got to get all these managed. Um, and it's a lot of work. Yeah. And now like the, the projects, historically housing grants and projects are kind of like a train in our state. Um, they've kind of always been going fast paced and these larger housing authorities and, um, you know, larger low income developers um, have had a pretty good hand in um, that housing funding for a long time. It's really they already know the ropes when it comes to these applications. And so you almost have to already have done it to get it. 
It is mm. very hard to get mm. housing. And I know that um, having gone through the the um, the three and a half million dollar grant for the mm. Veterans Project, it's not, I'm not going to say that they don't want you to get it, but they want to see a lot of capacity um, to give you this money. But that's interesting because if you don't, if you're an area that doesn't already have capacity, how do you show right. that you have capacity? Right. So one of one of the things that we would like to do is bring in um, a consultant, grant writer, developer, um, to be able to help us look down the road. Mm -hmm. um, because in Curry County, historically, we've not had a good, um, we've not had really good advocates here as far as looking down the road at what funding's coming. And there are a lot of advocates here. You know, I know uh, Beth attends a, a lot of meetings. There are, are a lot of agency leaders that attend a lot of state level meetings to try to get ahead of this. It's not possible for us to do that and do our work at the same time. Right. It's just, it's too big of a beast. There so, really is only 24 hours there in is, a day. There yeah. is. I've tried. I've tried <laughs> to stretch it. I haven't found a way. You've tried cloning yourself. Yeah, I tried mean, it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I did. Work. I did create four clones, but they're not quite <laughs> at the level where I can use them. In yes. This. They're yeah. still children, I believe. Still yes. Children. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it, it, it's like, you know, you kind of already have to be on that train to get to the place you need to be. So we're we're kind of watching the train go by and like how do we how do we get how on we there? Get you know? on. Yeah. And and so bringing in a consultant an expert that can help us set up not just mm -hmm. our agency but our our community mm -hmm. can help us set up to receive these federal funds every year, you know, and just we're just reapplying for these things as opposed to um you know, the grant comes out and then we're like, "Oh shoot," and we scramble to get to it. Exactly. If you are seeing it for the first time a day or a week after the grant has come out, you're already too late. Yeah. Um, I mean, yes, we did write that. We did get it submitted. But mm -hmm. to be honest, the developer had already attempted this a year before. So he was already looking ahead. Oh. So that's the only reason we, I think, we were able to so successfully get that written right. within a month. Because they give you 30 days for millions and millions of dollars. Wow. Um, that's why I didn't sleep much. So Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, <laughs> So it's very difficult to get housing funding. It's very difficult to get these federal funds into the community. And we don't have a good track record here of doing that. Mm -hmm. So this expanding the capacity for us just means we've now established ourselves with HUD. Um, mm -hmm. And those funds are, are actually coming directly into the community. So we Which should make a huge again. difference. It's I mean, going to make a big difference. Think about that hundreds and hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars that yeah. is new money coming yeah. into Curry County. And this is our money. So I don't know how many people know this, but when homes are, you know, when, when homes are built in Curry County, there's funds that go, that get kicked up taxes and, and fees that get kicked up to the state for housing, for housing development across the, the um, state. And in 10 years, Curry County hasn't received any of that funding back. <gasps> So the last uh, low-income housing development was Ocean Winds property, and that was about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago. Wow. So this funding um, is ours and wow. has, not, has not come back to our community since. So if we receive that $3.5 million, you know, that's funds that, that our community deserves and needs to have coming back into, into the county. So. So if you're going to have this kind of philosophical look at why affordable housing raises everybody up, mm -hmm. part of it is the fact that the money is coming into the community. Yeah. That, that raises all it's of us up. It's supposed to come into our community. That's the way it was set up. Yeah. But the state doesn't require you to have enough capacity to apply for your own funding. So if, if no, nobody wants not. to, if nobody right. steps up, it just goes to the rest of the state. And so, you know, I it, it behooves us to support agencies that are going after this state funding because it's it's our money, you know. Right. right. Um, so, yeah, I, it's Interesting. always been an en enigma to me that we, um, we don't want to receive state funding in more rural areas or, you know, I guess there's just – there's some – political will against it because I think it people feel that we're, you know, locking ourselves in with um, you know, the 
Salem and all of the rules and yeah, kind of in a way. Yeah, but um, <laughs> certainly, and I can say this as an agency that's about to receive some of those funds. Yeah, it makes me a little bit nervous. There's mm-hmm. a lot of regulation at the state and federal level. And it's not like I'm concerned about regulation and I'm concerned about standards and and ethics and all of that. It is that we have two admin staff. <laughs> right. Right. So we're so, yes. we're really um we're really trying to we're we're running as fast as we can in in anticipation of jumping onto the train. Which is crazy. I mean, it, it it's amazing. And, it, and what this capacity building fund is going to yeah. do is it's basically going to hire us a, a helicopter to get us on there and wrap it up in a neat package so that we just know what we're doing when we get yeah. there. Um, you know, we we know what we're doing, but it's so that we we know how to sustain this long term. So this so, funding doesn't go away. And once you kind of take it up a notch, you're up a notch. Exactly. And you don't ever have to go back down. No, and it's so right. much easier to, right. like I said, it's so much easier to just receive, to to look for other funding and to get that fund, and to just maintain on those annual renewals and things like that. And you know, it's not easy, but it just means that uh, it'll be a, our capacity will have expanded enough so that we're not worried all the time about losing that funding. Right. And I don't mean we as in core. What I really mean is we. The task force, we, and I don't speak for the task force, but mm-hmm. we as our partners, we as Curry County, and we as the citizens. And God knows Curry County needs all the help it can get. Absolutely. I mean, it always it always has, and yeah. clearly. And, and I know right now, speaking of the county itself, I know the county itself is in a, a quite a deficit. Yes. And so um, that may very well um, kind of trickle down to... Yeah. The residents. Yeah. I, I can't imagine that it wouldn't. Right. So it's more important that we get these safety nets in place. I agree. I agree. And and the thing that we've talked about a lot is the lack of safety nets. We've talked about that over the over yeah. the years that we've been talking, is that you know, the, the safety nets we think are there, and it turns out they're not. So no. yeah, yeah. We really need them to be there. So I'm I'm looking at the clock, Diana. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to talk as fast as I could. I know. I know. But once again, once again, we've run out of time. It's like amazing. But yeah. so I'm I'm thrilled that you guys are doing so much. Um, you know, I look yeah. back at, at where you were three years ago when you were just yeah. starting. And, you know, to be talking multi-million dollar grants at this point is like Yeah. So if, phenomenal. if you're... Even a friend of mine, if my dad's out there listening and you haven't seen me in a few months, you know, I'm just kidding. I just saw him yesterday. But um, no, for real, though, if, if yeah. people are wondering where I'm at, that's yeah. where I'm at. Yeah, she's, she's writing grants, okay? So that's, that's where she's why I've been a lot quieter. Yep. <laughs> that's where she's at. All right. Well, thank you again for coming yeah. on the show and thank you for everything that you do in the community. How can they find out more? What's your website? www.brookingscoreresponse.org. And um, I'll, we did just talk about all of this funding that's coming in, but I will say that there is a huge need for um, funding for walk-in services and just basic hygiene stuff. So if anybody ever wants to um, donate, you can give us a call or go on the website, 541-251-0825. And thank you for listening. Remember, the daylight hours are shortening, and as the night gets colder, People without shelter are cold, wet, and probably getting rousted by 6 a.m. from their tents and sleeping bags. Let's try to make it better, not worse, for all of us. I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community.